Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another thing where I talk about things. Uh, today we are going to be talking more about the sciences. Things such as science, such as metallurgy, metallurgy, material science. Because I still have a textbook on that, which means that I am pulling less crap out of my ass. Which is good. It's actually one reason why I put off the uh, the prion discussion for a little while is because I promised to do it, and I thought for sure I still had my old biochemistry books because I've hung on to a number of textbooks. Uh, just because it was one of those things, I, like you get in that mentality, is like, what if the knowledge becomes useful? And it tends not to be in my everyday life, which is why I use it to make videos sometimes or to make jokes on on stuff. But uh, I mostly just hang on to it, I guess, out of a. a Maybe a sense of wistfulness? Maybe not. I don't know. It'd be one of those things where, like, if I ever applied for a job in an actual field like this, and they would say, did you, did you, you know, like, so you have some of this background. Did you ever keep up on all this stuff? I could tell them yes. And they wouldn't believe me. But, uh, <laughs> I could say that I, I have the textbooks. I could brush up on it. But anyway, though, today we're going to be talking about, uh, uh, alloys and stuff like that. How to make alloys. Uh, it's actually kind of an interesting field. We're, we're still developing some understanding on how it all works. And in fact, it's helped us to develop stronger polymers, among other things. Polymers being stuff like plastic. We have plastics now that can be used to make firearms. We have some people who are afraid, in fact, because we have uh, firearms that can be printed in a 3D printing device, which means that people will be able to just make guns for themselves in the future. Uh, and then... Uh, Currently, the methods to detect them, I think, are, are kind of... They're not not—they're not too great. A lot of airports now feature the new high-tech, like, I will detect plastic in your pocket sort of thing. But as I read, mostly those, those new high-tech detecting devices are mostly just used to, to make fun of people's genitals. Uh, that is something that they actually do with that. Anyway, though, that aside, uh, we also do stuff with ceramics now. We're making, like, uh, ceramic knives which is rather interesting. We used to not be able to do that because ceramics, they tend to be very porous. Uh, porous meaning that there's a lot of air and crap inside them. They don't form very compact structures. So when you put them under any kind of shear stress, they snap. But we're getting to where we can make ceramics that don't suffer from that problem quite as well. And a ceramic knife is very sharp. Uh, it can be rather light. It's kind of a, an interesting development, rather, rather fun stuff. But what we're gonna talk about today are metal alloys because metals are a little bit easier to understand and there's more background it's less of a developing sort of thing uh, it still is of course but it's it's more it's just better studied I think uh, but anyway though so metals metallurgy one of the things that's most important about metals is that they form uh, they're very compact they're high density and the way that I want you to think about this is is when it comes down to atoms, imagine a bunch of golf balls, like each golf ball, you have a bunch of golf balls, each one is a iron atom, each little ball, and you pack them all into a box, and that box is a block of steel. This is how, uh, this is how iron is formed, is they're just a bunch of golf balls all stacked on top of each other. And objectively, you want to try and stack as many golf, ball, as many golf balls into one space as you possibly can. That's how you get the most compact structure, and that is how iron is formed, is you get a rather compact structure. Um, iron is very, it's very, uh, it's kind of more ductile among, uh, among metals. Ductile meaning that uh, you can stretch it out and it will actually rebound into its original shape, which is very important. Uh, what that means, what, the way that they test this, is they'll get a machine and they'll grab one end of your iron, and then they'll grab the other end, and uh, they apply force and they kind of stretch it out and you find that if you let it go up to a certain point then it'll go back to its normal shape, its normal shape and size and it'll be no damage done to the iron which is really important uh, when you're building a, a structure you know you put a lot of compressive force on your on your building materials you don't want them to deform when you do that you want them to be able to kind of snap back into their normal positions if you were to remove some of that force uh, that's important for bridges and other stuff, especially specifically things that will take force and then be relieved of that force later on. So like bridges, it's very important that they do that. Now, uh, it, this is actually something that comes up. It's an important subject in a lot of things. You also get into uh, geomechanical engineering is rather relevant. And in fact, I've uh, because I'm on the internet a lot these days and, and sort of make a good majority of my living anymore on the internet. Uh, not all of it, of course, but a good majority of it. Uh, I, I once scolded a guy from Sweden who was all pissed. He was posting pictures of uh, of 
of uh, Stockholm. And he was like, he's like, he goes, look at how short all the buildings are. He goes, clearly Sweden is living in poverty because of the immigrants. And, and then he was comparing it to New York, you know, which has all these tall buildings. And, uh, and I, I tried to explain to him that the immigrants weren't making the buildings short. Uh, it has to do more with the concept of, of engineering and this ductility and whatnot. But this not so much to do with the ductility of the building materials, but rather the ductility, the ductility of the soil itself. Because what you find out was that Scandinavia was buried under the polar ice caps. They were buried under the ice caps during the Ice Age. And when the ice caps melted, the glaciers receded. And so what you had was like a spring, the soil was pressed down. And when the glaciers receded, the soil sprang back up. And uh, rock, like ceramics, they don't do so well under that kind of stuff. So when it sprang back up, it broke, it, it fractured, it shattered. So when you go to Scandinavia, if you go to Stockholm, you'll notice that actually they don't have a lot of tall buildings. In fact, uh, as I've traveled with Kenza, this has come up. She and her friends sometimes comment. They're like, the buildings are so tall here in France or, or Germany or wherever. And it's because, uh, it's because of this, is, is that in Scandinavia, uh, the fractured bedrock makes it very difficult to build tall buildings. You can't get stable enough foundations. You can still build buildings, but to get a really stable foundation, you have to go much deeper when building your foundations, and it becomes considerably more expensive. So there are some taller buildings in Scandinavia, but they're harder to build, they're more costly, and it has nothing to do with, with Scandinavia being in poverty uh, or the immigration. It has, it has everything to do with the way that the, the dirt is laid out. So, uh, so yes, very important with engineering. The fact that uh, that uh, iron can is rather ductile is important. But actually, when you're getting into steel, uh, maybe we'll hit on this later. But the way that steel is produced is actually when you think of all those golf balls, right? There's golf balls are round, and so when you set them on top of each other, you wind up with little spaces in between all the golf balls where where there's just air. And, and what we call those, these are interstitial spaces, this little air between the golf balls. And, uh, and you find that actually you could fit crap in the interstitial space. If you really wanted to, very small atoms, uh, such as carbon, can fit into that interst interstitial space. And this is how you get steel. Uh, in fact, actually, this happens naturally. If you just take a block of carbon and you set it on top of a block of iron, then the carbon will naturally defuse into, this, into the iron, uh, into the little spaces between the iron atoms, because the carbon is much smaller and it can do that. Uh, it'll take a long time if you just set them on top of each other at room temperature, because the, the atoms bounce around, they're not bouncing very quickly, it doesn't make enough space for them to, to do that, but, uh, but they will. And I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, and I couldn't find in the book where it explains this, but I think that you can also combine uh, if two atoms are of similar size, uh, similar similar diameter, as far as the atoms, if the atoms are of similar diameter and they have the same crystalline structure, then they can diffuse as well. Because what will happen is your your uh, iron atoms will bounce around, and when one moves out of the way, you might have the other metal which will slide in in place of where the iron was. And again, this happens gradually unless you're doing a lot of heating, which causes the atoms to move around much more quickly, much more frequently. You make more space for stuff to move around, and they blend in. But more commonly though, they do this with, with carbon. And you have multiple types of steel actually, is, is you find out that what they don't do, they, they do not usually uh, do really high carbon steels because what happens when you introduce this carbon into your, into your structure is you get, a much, you get a much tougher sort of metal, uh, which is to say it can load more weight and be more comfortable, but it loses ductility. And what this means is that as you stretch it out, when it stretches, uh, you can't stretch it as far before you develop a problem. Uh, iron normally, you can stretch it out quite a ways and it'll snap back to its natural shape and it'll be nice and comfy. But steel, if you stretch it out very much, then, then it will just break. You have a structural failure and this is bad. You don't want that. And, and so it's, it's kind of tough to deal with. So a lot of times what they do is they actually make low carbon steel Low carbon steel is, uh, is a little bit more ductile. They get some carbon atoms in there, which strengthens the iron, makes it stronger, but it doesn't reduce the ductility so much that your, your, 
steel, your steel can still withstand some compression and some tension. Uh, you get into higher carbon steels for things like railroad tracks, uh, stuff that's that's a little bit tougher, but that you know requires a little bit less, uh, like not not quite the same compression as as like a bridge or a building. And and I can't remember what high high carbon steels are used for. I should should have looked it up. It's too late now. Anyway, though, but uh, but yes, low carbon steels are most common in uh, in structures. You also get stuff where they add in copper or nickel or things like that, and those will help uh, even it out as well. Those will make it a little bit tougher. It's the same thing. Those fit into the interstitial spaces, and and actually, kind of an interesting thing, a sort of a fascinating note. They used to make weapons like this, like steel. Of course, they made they made steel weapons, and I think, uh, if I remember correctly, Damascus steel was always a big mystery. They didn't understand how that was being made, but it turns out that Damascus steel was just steel being made with uh, with fullerenes. And what fullerenes are is they are carbon compounds that are very very stable, more stable than diamond, in fact. And they would just have these carbon fullerene structures, and they would get in and, and make an alloy with the iron, and then you would have incredibly tough. Uh, incredibly tough steel and so Damascus Damascus steel that was how that was made uh, but you get into sometimes you read about stories and if you guys watch watched the last airbender on Nickelodeon then you might remember there was a scene where Sokka finds a meteorite and he turns it into a sword and this actually is is something that happened historically speaking this was a real thing it got into a lot of popular stories because a lot of times you would get meteors that would fall out of the sky and these meteors would have formed natural alloys. Reason being that there are a lot of extreme temperatures in space, and so you've got this iron, you've got these metals in the meteorites, and they would just over time uh, diffuse into each other and create steel, their own kind of steel. And it would be the sort of steel that they didn't really have the technology to make back in the days. It would have copper in it, it would have nickel in it, it would be carbon, you know, carbon, nickel, steel. And you would get stronger steel than what they knew how to make. Uh, so star swords were a real thing, very uncommon, but sometimes made much better weapons than, than what the people were used to. Sometimes they made much worse weapons because, as I say, when you get too much carbon, it becomes uh, less ductile. It's more likely to, to snap under too much... Uh, if you exceed its, its stress. Uh, the way that it works is that a thing will, will stretch a certain amount, kind of depending on... Like, it withstands more force, but it doesn't withstand stretching. That's the important thing to take home from it. So if you... If you it, can make them, it can make them kind of like... It can make them kind of fragile, in a sense, uh, because the way it works is that each each uh, crystal structure has ways that the atoms can slip. Like they're lined up, but you have like one layer of of uh, golf balls, another layer of golf balls, another layer of golf balls. The, having interstitial atoms helps kind of prevent the slipping, but uh, but you can you can kind of pull the atoms along the layers that they that you, like they slide apart. So, uh, so it's easier for them to snap back. If you think about when there's like stuff in the way, the only way that they're gonna slide around is if you snap them, if you break them. So that's why having too much carbon makes it easier for them to break, but only along certain ways. So for example, certain kinds of alloys uh, have worse, they withstand certain kinds of uh, forces, not as well. But anyway though, uh, that is metallurgy as, as far as just a crash course uh, more more this book actually has uh, focuses a lot more on the the uh, math behind it it's like this is this is your rates of diffusion and this is how you produce the right amount of diffusion and these are the the compounds like the, they talk about more like this is how you make the particular kind of steel that you want in a timely and cost-effective manner uh, that's what the real science is mostly about but uh, but yes that is, that is the lesson for the day. That is the personal time for today. I will catch you guys later.